Hello, everyone. My name is Giuseppe LaRocca. I'm here with Noah Curtis and Mike Torres. This is the Trequartista podcast. We have an excellent show today, right, guys? Yeah, can't wait. Definitely. We have uh, on the phone with us right now data scientist for Opta. <laughs> We're calling him a data scientist. <laughs> and writer, uh, th- he writes the central r- winger on MLS.com. A lot of you might be familiar with it. We certainly are. Uh, Devin Pluler. Devin, how are you? I'm good, guys. How are you? Doing good. We're doing really well. So why don't you kind of open it up and tell us exactly what you do? Because, you know, data science, st- statistics, and soccer, it's kind of a new movement, and you're really at the forefront of that movement. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely a, it's a brand new movement. You know, it uh, you know, has our ability to kind of collect data has increased so much over the last, you know, you know, three, four years, you know, it's naturally kind of found its way into soccer. Um, and uh, what I do exactly, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's become a bit of a buzzword, but it, it's very similar to, you know, what you see in Moneyball. It's about, you know, looking at players objectively using, you know, stats as a, as a means for, you know, um, you know, taking a closer look and kind of valuing these players and, you know, um, you know determining, you know, uh, value, uh, essentially. Yeah, and I know before you took the role at Opta, uh, you had started the Central Winger. Did you do this as a hobby, uh, this data science as a hobby, or how, how did it come about exactly? Uh, yeah, it started, um, actually it started as a senior project in uh, college. Um, you know, I had... Uh, I had found some of Opta's uh, chalkboard uh, um, web things uh, that uh, I was very interested in. I was, you know, curious what was fueling it and kind of what other value could be gleaned from it. Um, so I, I naturally kind of just picked up that and uh, you know I started a start a blog afterwards. Um, you know, and that kind of just got you know got everything rolling. You know, I was able to. Uh, you know, promote some of my stuff, and you know, MLS caught a hold of it, and you know, it's all been uphill since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I, I kind of wanted to to ask you about, Devin, because you know, if you talk to maybe some of the, I guess, kind of like old school um, football fans, or, or even managers, traditionalists, as I um, like to call myself. <laughs> you know, when you when you talk, I mean, you know, statistics for them, they they don't always kind of whole lot of water they don't always pay attention attention to those and you know for maybe a casual um, soccer fan especially in America where you're used to um, a lot of other American sports that are heavily fueled by statistics like baseball for example soccer for most people it's like well I mean there's goals yeah. so you can keep track of those and like yeah. you can keep track of like clean sheets and like maybe assists like yeah so what are some of the other kind of Stats like that are they're starting to emerge in this kind of new movement that are really kind of, I guess, going to be useful for managers and for fans. Um, that's a there's a lot of content to that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the first thing I you know, kind of like to point out is you know this kind of movement. Uh, you know, it's it's hard convincing uh, you know a lot of these traditionalists you know of the of the value of some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I've gone back to this line a few times, and it's, you know, I think it requires just as much social engineering as it does, you know, right. technical engineering. You know, being able to not just come up with these metrics that you think are valuable, but also being able to portray them in a way that, you know, these non-technical people can also understand and can kind of say to themselves, you know, oh, that's kind of cool. I can see how that's applicable. Um, so that that's one whole end of it. The other whole end of it is actually getting the you know stuff that's actually worth it, um, and that's quite difficult itself. Um, and it really comes down to the type of data you're collecting. Uh, Opta, for example, you know collects every single off the uh, on the ball uh, event, uh, you know paired with a x y coordinate and a timestamp. So I know you know what's happening on the ball at every single second and and where. Um, you know, and we're just now starting to move beyond things like counting, 
you know, how many passes this player completed or yeah. how many interceptions this player uh, completed. You know, now we're looking at, well, what's the value of that interception? What's the value of that pass? You know, obviously certain passes are more valuable than others. And as we kind of dig deeper and deeper, we find even more interesting stuff. So that's kind of where we're headed. Mm -hmm. So do you think the United States is at the forefront of, say, the soccer statistics or have other countries been doing it for quite a while now and, you know, the United States is kind of catching up? Well, it was, it was certainly born in Europe, um, but it's, it's growing up here a bit. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, partially because, you know, this, this social barrier over here is, is a lot, uh, really not quite as high, you know. Um, I think just that, you know, American sports culture has really, you know, kind of grown up in the, you know, in the, you know, at least in a setting where data and, you know, stats are, are pretty commonplace. Um, so you do see, uh, especially with MLS clubs, you know, there's four or five clubs that uh, have full-time analysts. You know, yeah. Perez, for example, uh, hired this gentleman named Tim Crawford last year. And, you know, the Revs president, you know, he came out and said, you know, I'm not hiring scouts. I'm hiring this analyst instead. What he's doing is making my scouts more, you know, uh, more valuable. You know, he's saving them time. Instead of, you know, these scouts getting scouting sheets of hundreds of players, instead, you know, we can whittle this, you know, these huge lists down to, you know, five, ten players. And that saves time. That saves money. Uh, so, so it's pretty common in MLS. Um, over in Europe, it's gone a little bit different of a route. It's more performance analysts, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, collecting physical information, yeah. speed, stamina, that kind of things, and optimizing that. And that's kind of, you know, the, uh, you know, Europe's a little bit slower to move into raw stats. Yeah, Devin, I think this is actually fascinating. So, like, take us through the role of, say, a team data analyst. Are they interacting with players? How does... What's the information that they're giving players? What's the information that they're giving coaches? And how, in, in turn, does the team use that? Uh, I was just uh, exchanging emails this week with uh, the performance analyst at uh, New York. Um, and what they do uh, is they receive, you know, data after every single game. And uh, it's, um, the players are, you know, presented this information, um, you know, at the next practice during a, a video session. What, what's... One of the parts of the val uh, one of the most valuable parts of the data is actually just being able to segment video very efficiently. So you know uh, th these raw data feeds that you know, these clubs receive, they can um, you know uh, plug it into a video system and you know just be able to say, I want to see every single interception that you know Olave made beyond on the 66th minute, and it can you know, very quickly play all those clips so they can, um, so, you know, for these, for, cer uh, for certain analysts, it's really just about, you know, presenting video efficiently to these players. Uh, you know, the players aren't necessarily seeing these raw stats. They're not seeing their, you know, maybe they'll see their, uh, you know, past completion ratio, but they're, they're not seeing these advanced metrics, but they are seeing you know, they are interfacing with the data through the medium of the video, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, the, you know, other analysts, you know, you know, some analysts are, you know, trying to develop metrics that they think, you know, more effectively value players. Um, and uh, that's, that's a bit harder of a problem. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the modern data analyst really does, you know, you know their fingers are in a lot of pods. Um, yeah, and it's it's really interesting. Speaking of uh, interesting, what what do you think is some of the more interesting stats you've uh, found uh, in your uh, research? Maybe like you were going into uh, you're going into this, and you just you know you didn't expect this uh, this result when writing one of your articles, like I don't know, like the aerial balls or say the short corners. Sure. Yeah, th I think those are my last two major league soccer articles. Um, and it doesn't. It doesn't have to be from those two. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think the most interesting stat, uh, at least for myself, uh, that I found fascinating has been what I like to call the secondary uh, pass completion rate. So essentially, what this measures is not. Um, so the, the problem with some of the, the data is that it, it, it lacks a bit of context. So. Right. 
when you look at you know a, a very simple pass from player A to player B, uh, you don't really know how good that pass was. Uh, for example, you know, say I you know I pass the ball to Joe and Joe receives the ball, but then he's suddenly crushed by on you know on running defender. You know, right. it so counts as a completed team. pass, but it, in reality, it wasn't the best pass. It wasn't an efficient pass. Exactly. So you know, I'm not able to. You know, if I'm looking at you know this one specific event, I can't really tell if it was a good pass or right. if it was a you know hospital ball. Right. Uh, so what I begin to look at is you know in more of a you know looking at the you know stepping back and looking at sequences of play. Uh, you know, I, I've been looking at players that complete passes that cause their teammates to also complete passes at higher rates. So, you know, it starts to remove some of this bias towards, you know, completing the pass with, you know, these hospital balls as described um, and, and really starts to, you know, drill down to uh, some more, I think, useful statistics. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, especially like, for example, a team like Barcelona, where there, there's so many passes that are completed during a game, that, that secondary pass would be pretty interesting to look yeah. at for a team like that because – you know, that, that first pass, if anyone wa that watches Barcelona play, I mean, a lot of their pass seems to be very simple. It's just a quick pass from player A to player B, and it might only be seven yards away, six yards right. away. But then that second pass could be a through ball. That second uh -huh. pass could be sweet. Like, so I think, yeah, I mean, you, that's, that's actually a really fascinating kind of step because, like you say, I mean, a player could complete 100 passes, but if 50 of those passes were back to the goalkeeper, I mean, how much impact is he necessarily right. having all, and, you know, in the whole game? Um, yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting stat. One thing, um, I, I mean, are, are there any kind of stats that you would say are um, are a little bit misleading? I mean, I, I know like possession is a stat that kind of, you know, anyone that watches a game on like ESPN say, I mean, ESPN shows a very limited number of stats generally. Usually, it's like shots, corners, fouls, and and possession usually is kind of one of the ones that is a little bit more. I guess people would say is like an in depth. It's tracking like a percentage yeah. of the time that a team has the ball. And uh, but would you? I mean, how how important is possession? I mean, I think we've all seen games where you, you could have thirty five percent of the ball but still win. Yeah. So so how misleading of a stat do you think possession is? Uh, well, I think uh, it, it's incredibly misleading. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, Major League Soccer, I think it was two years ago. I haven't run the numbers recently, uh, but the uh, the. You know, uh, average percent, uh, possession of a winning team actually was under 50%. I think it was somewhere near 48, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for other European leagues, you, uh, you do see it a bit higher. I think I remember 53 or 54, but I think that's actually uh, incredibly biased by teams that possess the ball a lot. Um, you know, I think that's you know, probably being biased by the, the Uniteds and the Cities and the mm -hmm. Chelsea's, the teams sure. that you know, have the quality to <clears throat> Keep possession of the ball. Um, so when we're looking at the you know, the league at a at a very high level, uh, when we're averaging across everything, that's you know that's kind of a recipe for disaster with a lot of different stats. So you need to really put these things in the right context. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, I, I do think possession is valuable, um, but it's 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 very much contextual. It it, it depends yeah. on where that possession yeah. is. Yeah, it's and a quality it's, possession versus absolutely. say possession at the back or possession that you know doesn't go forward. I'm assuming. Absolutely. If I have fifty, you know, if I have sixty percent of the possession and that a lot of that possession was in the attacking half, that's really good. Yeah. But if I have sixty percent of the possession and most of that possession's in my half, yeah, that really isn't quite as interesting. So you know. Yeah. I, you know, of course, you know, I'm all for overlooking, you know, using these numbers, but we need to be very careful on how we use them. Yeah, let's open this up a little bit now. What do you see in terms of t statistics, some, some major differences between some of the European leagues and the domestic league here, the MLS? Is there anything eye-popping? Um, I know that's kind of a high, like, it just a, you know, a BS question, but, I mean, there might be something <laughs> we can get out of this, right? Like, you know. No, it's, it's not a BS question. Um, you know, I, I think this is actually probably one of the most important questions in a lot of the senses for uh, clubs. Uh, I, actually, because... I actually put an asterisk next to it because I really knew it was the most important, <laughs> but I want to make it off right. like I'm stupid. But really, it was the best one. I, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> 
No, it's actually, you know, being able to, you know, when a, when a European club is looking at uh, signing a player from another league, um, there's a lot of risk factor here. You know, say, you know, you know, if, a, if an EPL team was to sign a striker, you know, from a lower lower end uh, team, and also in the EPL, you know, that player may have already proven that he can play at this level, he can score in the EPL. Um, but when we're moving players from different leagues, when we're comparing leagues, you know, numbers don't translate quite as easily. Right. <clears throat> so being able to understand, um, you know, or, or get some kind of expected value out of these players between transfers is, is really one of the major uh, problems. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting problem space and it's, it's not easy, um, but, there's a, but there's a few things that you can do to look at. Um, you know, you can look at, you know, what, what type of teams are playing in those leagues or the uh, particular tactical dispositions and, and what that means for particular players in different systems. But at the end of the day, you know, data at this point is really just a supplemental thing. Um, it's not telling right. me, oh, this player in the in the Dutch league is going to score eight eight goals in the EPL after scoring sixteen last year. We can't do that. What we can do is uh, through data, we can get you know, we can add context to that decision. We can you know help the coach out. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately, no matter how good the stat is, I don't think we're ever going to make the decision for him. Oh. Um, I guess another question I had, I mean, now that we're sort of wrapping this up, who is the most statistically well-rounded player that you've covered? That I cover? Um, and by funny. cover, I mean actually have data on. Um, I, I, I found that in a lot of uh, you know, MLS-centric things that I do, um, that Dax McCarty does... Uh, seem to do quite well, um, you know, uh, and I think he's kind of a good story. You know, he's a player that's really built for Major League Soccer, maybe he doesn't have the tools to compete at the international level, um, but, you know, he just goes out and gets his job done relatively quietly. Yeah. The, the, stats, the stats aren't as quiet. It's, a, you know, it's, really, it's really clear that he's quite a strong player. And teams? Um, I'm, I'm partial to Kansas City uh, because they – because they like to play really high up the field. Um, uh, I think one of the you know, uh, one of the great indicators, uh, especially in Major League Soccer, in terms of success, is you know not just that you're winning the ball a lot. It's more that you know more where you're winning the ball. If you're winning the ball, maybe attacking third, it's great. You know, uh, a majority of goals are scored from possessions that you know originate in the attacking half. Uh, and Kansas City pushes up really high wins the ball in the attacking half at a significantly higher rate than, you know, the, the rest of the league. Um, and that, that shows the stats as well. All right. Thanks, Dev. How can listeners of uh, the Trek Guartista podcast get a hold of you? Uh, obviously, you have the central winger on MLS.com, Twitter yeah, handle. MLSsoccer.com. MLSsoccer.com. Wow. See, MLSsoccer.com. I, every time I go to MLS.com, <laughs> it's, a real it's, random, it's a real estate uh, page. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Man, they must be holding that that web page tight, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> holding it hostage. Jeez, how uh, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Uh, well, you can uh, check out you know, Major League Soccer, uh, MLSsoccer dot com. Uh, I think it's every Tuesday. Um, you know, usually in the afternoons on Eastern Standard Time, I I have an article comes out. Um, and otherwise, you can look at my backlog of stuff that's also available on the site. And otherwise, I'm you know pretty readily available on Twitter. So. And what's your uh, Twitter handle? Uh, it's just my first and my last name, Devin Pluler. That's P L E U L E R, correct? <laughs> it's, it's taken you a few years, Joe, but you got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think every time I message you, still, it's, I still you spell, spell it incorrectly. Yeah, and I don't even know. How, I don't even want to know how it's spelled to my phone. So, all right, Devin, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Devin. Good really interesting. You, thank you very much, and uh, happy birthday, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, look, at that. <laughs> look at that. Have a good one, gentlemen. Take care. You too. Yeah, I thought that was uh, it's really fascinating stuff. It I is mean, I know, I know for you, Joe. You know me. You know me. You're a traditionalist. <laughs> I call myself a traditionalist. Not in but, many things, but, in but, cuisine as well. But, <laughs> but I'm just but, saying, but like. This, I, think, I think a lot of, of what we just talked about holds a lot of It does, without question. Without because question. 
especially the I, I thought the last one of the last things he said in regards to the European leagues was especially interesting to me, which is you know the idea of of being able to kind of value a player, yeah. right? The investments that are getting made, and we'll talk about this you know a little bit later when we talk about transfers and, and what's going on in the transfer market, but the amount of money that's being poured into these players, the investment is is massive financially. Correct. And so if you have somebody that can say, well, look, you know, here's some here's some statistics on, you know, how this player plays, passes they complete, times that they're able to, you know, the, if a forward, you know, here's how many times this forward's made tackles. Like, we can see that he's, he <coughs> is willing to go and play a little back. This guy likes to drop and receive the ball. You know, when you can tell them that, and, and, and what he said about kind of comparing leagues and giving a manager an idea, I mean, that's – that could be very invaluable to a club that, especially not a big club, a middle of the road club that's saying, you know, we have fifteen million to spend this summer. We want to make well, an investment. And you see that middle of the road club, but I also think that applies to the players as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, some of the bigger transfers, some of the bigger players like a Falcao, Bahrainovic, Cristiano Ronaldo, you don't really need the statistics to back well, it's, them up. It's a, yeah, it's but I think it's for those players, say, you know, <laughs> central midfielder, outside midfielders that, you know won't cost you that much, but could make a difference for your team, well, also, that's when you want to see how much of a difference also, they can make. Also, I mean, what he was talking about, like the, like the Dutch league, for example, players from maybe not a, not a major European league, yeah. and MLS even, too, for European teams that scout in America, um, you know, the, to be able to kind of unearth that diamond in the rough. I mean, you look at teams, yeah. I, I'd be curious to know how a team like, let's say, um, for example, Everton, who tend to buy pretty well, um, you know, I'd be curious to see kind of the maybe if they have analysts that are able to kind of help these managers out with with some of the buys. I mean, managers get a lot of credit, right? Like managers that are known as like wheeling and dealing yeah. and able to kind of bargain buy these people. But I wonder how much, if any, help they're getting from from maybe some some statistical analysis because you know that for those smaller clubs that have a little bit tighter budget, they do have to go and find. <laughs> Someone that maybe can be a starting central midfielder that they can't spend fifteen million on. They can spend eight million. Yeah. And you, if you can have a guy that says, "Hey, you know, this guy might not be a flashy name, but he's played in Norway and he's played very well. Maybe that, maybe that saves you money and and you get a nice player." Well, one of the one of the funny things that Fleur brought up is a video analyst. Uh, mm-hmm. There was just yeah. an article in Soccer Man today about Guardiola, and he. Uh, he just hired a uh, analyst for Bayern. Yeah. we snapped up. Well, the show I mean, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna slow down the, the statistical. It's not. Uh, a I mean, it's but, all... but it's. I mean, it's not gonna slow down. I mean, Adidas. I don't know if you guys remember last year. Adidas had the whole um, like smart soccer yeah, campaign, yeah. and I think they piloted that in MLS. They probably still are because MLS has such a you know big relationship with Adidas. But um, you know that stuff is not gonna go away. Obvious. Oh, you know, no, obviously. but I mean the fact that they're integrating it with video. I mean, I you remember what was it? Your your well, my junior year, your sophomore year, when we had our own uh, high school videographer, and we used to have to uh, watch videotapes of our uh, mistakes. Oh, that's right. With, yeah. Uh, JD. But yeah. just uh, the ability to just kind of pinpoint just anything yeah. via this. Well, I mean, uh, well he was just a judgmental point. prick, really. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter if what you're watching, though. But yeah. it, one one way yeah. in which <laughs> in which this. Data, this data science can definitely help. Is when you have a manager, you have a squad that's set with a formation. You know, say they have one striker up top and rely on they, their wing play. They want to bring players in who have, who can complete successful yeah. dribbles, not, who can, can com- complete successful crosses. Yeah. And that's where really where it comes into play. When you have a set formation, not even a, and you know a, what you need. Not even just a formation, but a culture and a or style. A, yeah, I, a style I mean, of play you know, too. When, yeah. when you know. If, I'll use Barcelona as an example because a lot of people know how Barcelona yeah. plays. You know, Barcelona is not going to say, "Hey, let's bring in a guy that you know is not very good at keeping possession, but he can play lots of long balls." Yeah, no, that's they're not, not going to do that. That's not it. right. They're going to say, "Hey, this guy knows how to keep possession. He's been he plays. You know, this he has this this and this that we value A, B, and yeah. C. That you know they bring those guys in and 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 video and, and stats only make that easier. I mean, the other thing too that was really fascinating with the video. Is just for coaches, to, to leaving the players out of it. If a coach says, "Hey, after the 70th minute, I want to see the meaningful passes made by this midfielder," maybe there's only one. Now the coach can say, "You know what? Maybe after 70 minutes, this this player this player's not a 90 minute player. Maybe he's a 70 minute player. Maybe that's a guy that I'm going to look to sub." You know what I mean? Yeah. Those things can obviously be telling because they can they can give you that could be a difference between zero points, one point, zero points, three points. You know. Those those things can add up obviously during the course of the year too. That's I guess that's an example of kind of like an in game. We talk yeah. a lot about value, but like in game kind of adjustments and, and things that coaches could know, 
you know, going going ahead to the next games is is that type of information. All right, let's uh, go on to our next segment, which is the Confederation Cup. Um, yeah, let's talk about it. It starts it's this happen, week. Yeah. It's going to happen in Brazil. Um, prep- More than one stadium. I'm sorry? More than one. More, More than, than one stadium, Americana. yeah. So, uh, honestly, like, tell me how you actually feel about the tournament. Because before we go into the teams and everything else, well, let's actually talk about the tournament, where it stands in your eyes. You Mike, want, why don't you go you ahead and uh, start us up with this? Well, like, Confederation Cup. I know Brazil, uh, Portugal isn't in it, <laughs> but what... Like, what do you think of when you think of the Confederation Cup? Are you interested in watching it? Is it a trophy that doesn't mean anything to you? Uh, yeah. I have a feeling you guys know what direction I'm going into. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like neither here nor there. I mean, at least the last Confederations Cup, we kind of – the U.S. was in it, and they made things well, that was, pretty that was pretty. That was like, pretty that was exciting. exciting. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, they knocked off Spain, and they almost beat Brazil in we're the ahead, final. We're ahead against ahead Brazil. Ahead to nothing. But – um. Yeah, I don't really have a stake in it, obviously. It seems like not many teams really care too much about yeah. it. Like, I mean, it, it'll be, it'll may, it might be good for the Mexico coach to uh, try to straighten his squad up since, I mean, the qualifiers, they are just doing awful. But, yeah, I mean, I'm neither here nor there. No, how do you feel? I think well, what you said, I, I think, makes a lot of sense in, in the idea of... Um, I, I personally, I don't care about it. I, I like watching... Soccer, so I'm sure they yeah, all watch nice the games. I'm not gonna. Match. The thing that gets me about it, there's there's two things that I think are. It, I don't like how FIFA tries to pump it up yeah, as a real. Exa- exactly. Exactly. This this is they should call it what it is, which is essentially it's a it's a chance for the country hosting the World Cup the following year to have a, a dry run. They can shoot their wad on on a dry run, and and. It's a chance for them to see yeah. well, what works, what doesn't work. They're doing it on a much smaller scale than what Brazil will be seeing yeah. next summer, and and that's that's where the real value. That, of the that's where to what, me it's to me it's the only value, yeah, right? Yeah. Apart from the fact that if if you're bored in the summer, you can. And I think that's what it started out as, just but, kind of a well, test. And then they realized, hey, you know, we well, can, make, can a, make we can make a dollar or two but, off but, of this. <laughs> to me, it's I, I think that if you really wanted the games to to be more enjoyable, I, I think what you do is. You know, you have to try to figure out a way to make it a little bit more incentivized for the teams to, to compete and try to win. Because because I don't care if you bring, I don't care if you bring a first choice squad or youth and mix or whatever you want to do. But but even the the guys that go don't care. Yeah. Like that's that's really the issue. Is like the games aren't entertaining. The fans, the stadiums are half empty because fans don't want to pay the exorbitant rates that they get charged. Like they should be letting people to go to these games for free. Yeah. Frankly, I mean it's it's so stupid. Like. That, that, that's what gets me about it. And the second thing that gets me about it, especially right now, like, they're playing these games in the, like right after and before World yeah. Cup qualifiers, like yeah. the yeah. games that actually matter for the yeah. teams trying to go next summer. And, and like, for Mexico, like, the, Mexico has, like, the Gold Cup they have to play in the summer, which I know doesn't really mean anything, and this is one of the Gold Cups that, like, gets you to the Confederations Cup, but, like, they have a tournament there. They have World Cup qualifiers, and now they have to go to this stupid thing. It's, like... Do you don't you're not going to get the best out of anyone. Like no. the coaches aren't thinking about it. They show up because they have to show up. And and you know, I, so I, I think that that aspect of it annoys me. I think to make it a lot better, I think you know what? How make it just make it just a youth tournament? Why I don't know why you can't. They have a U twenty. That's fine. You want you want a hot take? You have the you have the U twenty World Cup this summer. Why don't you just move the U twenty World Put Cup it there, there? Put it there. Where there's going to be kids that want to win. It gives the country a chance for a real test run. Mm-hmm. The, the let every let all the fans come in for free. You'd get a chance to see like stars of tomorrow, maybe even some kids that'll be at the World Cup the next year. I think that would be way more fun for me to watch the U twenty World Cup on that... a bigger stage than watch than watch like thirty year old res- national reserves like walk around the pitch in a half empty stadium. Like I don't care about it. It's good. The the only value of it it gives the it gives the host country a chance to figure out their infrastructure, security, all that junk. That that is. But you could do that with say a U twenty tournament. That was the take hard. of the day. Honestly, great take. Uh, I couldn't have said it better yeah. myself. I can't tell you how much it frustrates me seeing players, and I always use this example, but when I see Andrea Pirlo playing in a Confederation Cup tournament when he's 32 years old, right, and he's played a whole season with Juventus, he's had to go right from the season to qualifiers, right from qualifiers to Confederation Cup, he gets a week off and then starts the season up against, again with Juventus, and then, what, next year you have the World Cup. you got to play that. 
it's too much soccer for these players. Like, they need this Can break. I they need a week or two. Give it to them. Let them play yeah. the, the qualifiers. And if you want to do the tournament in Brazil or if you want to do it in the host nation of, of the World Cup, have a U20 World Cup there or have some sort of other invitational tournament where you're utilizing yeah. the facilities, more than one yeah. facilities. Uh, you're bringing people in. That's, that's fine. But for the players, it's just too much. I hate to see these players go from one place to another place to another place. I know yeah. they're soccer players and they make millions of dollars, but it's almost but too it's, much but it's, soccer. It's, like, not, it's almost too much. You're not getting quality soccer from these games. No, you're Where, not. Sometimes you do. Like, but it doesn't I, matter, seen, quality soccer or not. You can injure yourself oh, yeah, yeah. You know, well, I mean, taking a bad and, step. Yeah. And if one of those players gets injured, a serious injury in the Confederations Cup, it's just terrible. What it's I'm, freaking what, terrible. What, I, I will. I, this no, see, yeah, combat it, combat it, combat it. I'm ready to that, go. I don't think that Andrea Pirlo playing for Italy is the Confederations Cup fault. I think that's the fault of the Italian national team to make this guy. He shouldn't be going. No, but, but when you like, when you pump it up like this, like every uh, the I, Brazil the Brazil's team, bringing their team. I mean, everybody's no, bringing see, their team. Brazil has to bring their team because they're playing. Do they have? To? They do. They do have to. Mexico is, is no, pretty. Mexico, there's just a heightened emphasis on I, this I just, this tournament now, yeah, and it's you don't just have to, Italy, unnecessary. Italy could play well at this tournament without Andrea Pirlo. They could. They could. They could. I don't, could. See, uh, I don't that, think it's, that frustrates I don't blame, me. I don't blame, I, I'm I don't just blame using Pirlo as an example. No, you right. can use player X, player Y, player Z. No. I use Pirlo because that's a player that we definitely would never want to lose. But any of them, El Sharawi, I wouldn't want to see injure himself in a stupid Confederations Cup tournament. No, you're, you're right I, about that, but I'm just like, saying... I, like, don't, I don't want any of these you know, players. The, the, the injury thing I, I have less of a thing with because, yeah, Pirlo might... might you, you hold him out of the Confederations Cup or whatever, he doesn't get hurt. But who's to say the first day of preseason training, he, he, breaks, he doesn't break his leg? Like, Injuries happen sometimes. Like I know more games can wear the body down. I, I get it, but, but like to me, you, yeah, you're already you're almost maxed out. Yeah, after I, the season, I, I, do you know I what mean, I mean. Like, I get it, I, and I I'm think. just adding to the point that you're making. Like you made the initial point, which I thought was an A plus take. I'm just saying you no. got to also take into yeah, account yeah. the I mean, player. I mean, well, it's, I mean, I don't think FIFA. I think FIFA rarely takes into account it the sucks. player. I mean, it sucks. Account the money. I mean, the, the, we we can talk the, about the the, uh, the initial yeah. the initial premise of the of the tournament which i felt like was was not a stupid idea but like you know it was a cast hey, you hit the nail on the thing. head it was it was a, a run but, to see if and I'm if all, everything and would I'm, work correctly and i'm completely in favor of that which that, is amazing because even idea. after even after the confederations cup um last confederations cup they still kept the vuvuzela for the world cup it made no yeah. sense to me <laughs> uh, <laughs> just a little fun just a little fun for the i i think um <laughs> I think it's great to have the the, 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 the kind of um, preliminary run or whatever you want to call yeah. it. That's a great idea because it does help you work. No, and, out. especially and, in Brazil hosting, right now where I think hosting, you need it. Yeah. Well, just hosting a World Cup in general is a, is a massive yeah. undertaking for a lot of countries. So it's I think that's great. I think that having it be the way it is right now, it frankly, like it's not in the, the people that FIFA wants to watch it don't care. No. The players... They don't care. The coaches, they don't care. Especially when you're putting it smack dab in the middle, like right after vital World Cup well, no. qualifiers. It, that's that is this mind-numbingly stupid. The people that are watching it are watching it because you you love watching the yeah, game. Yeah, it's not even, it's not because you want the trophy. What's well, funny about it is you go and you, you lift the trophy in the end and you're looking at it like what what exactly am I lift? What am I winning right now? The confederations. It's, ex, ex, you're the best confederation. It's, you you win it for your confederation. You know, I it's think, like, all right, great. I, I, I won the spring league. Like, it it's, doesn't it's, matter. It's, no, it's 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 a dumb thing. It's I don't think it it doesn't mean anything. I, I don't like. I um, hold the no. Nah, well, obviously, it does, it's, it's, stupid. it's so it's, it's <laughs> stupid, stupid. It's so stupid. If, if the the coolest thing FIFA could do is put the U twenty World Cup the summer before the real World Cup, how much more? I, because I can tell you this, like, I will watch. A few Confederations Cup games. I will not. This will not be appointment viewing for me. I'm not going to sit down. I would rather go on Netflix and watch Arrested Development reruns than watch the Confederations Cup. I, I think both of you guys would probably agree with that. And, and Italy's playing. <laughs> like, it, it, and and look how unexcited you are as an Italy fan. Like, it's it's just stupid. I'm not. Yeah, I'm it's just so stupid. I'm part unexcited, but part just very cautious. You put very you, cautious. You put a U20 World Cup there. How? 
I would watch I'd every watch game. I would watch every single I, game. I would. Put it there. I would. Because th- th- I, I love watching like young players come out. Like th- th- they're gonna care so much more. You you let the fans in for either for very cheap or for free or whatever. Yeah. The stadiums are gonna be full in, in a in a country like Brazil. Imagine the Brazilian youth team out there playing samba in their way around the field. You got England disappointing everybody. It be it would be a hell of a time. And I think it would be <laughs> I think it would be really. I would I would pay so much more attention. It would bring so much more. I think it would bring a lot more positive attention to FIFA on like the best part of the game, which is watching young players, not these like jaded veterans that are like, "Why the hell am I in this stupid tournament? I want to go to Dubai and yeah. tan or whatever they want to do." Like, I want to go to Shamal Sheikh with my with my lover. Yeah, you're obviously your mistress, not your not your wife. No, no. And, <laughs> um, I mean, that's so. Yeah, I mean, that's that's all. I I, could, I mean, do you have anything you want to kind of steamroll here? No, I mean, no, I started it off. Uh, he started. He kicked off the uh, side of that. No, I mean, I think you guys covered it pretty well. Do you, listeners, you, before we do it, listeners, tell us what you think of the, the Confederations and give Cup. And your, give us your favorite give, Confederations Cup moment from the, <laughs> from the years. Uh, no, seriously. Uh, tell us what you think. Uh, it won't have any effect on whether or not they do the tournament. But, I'm still going to do it. You know, no, we can have a, a good Maybe review. I'll email Seth Ladder and... And ask him if he wants to do the U twenty thing. Yeah, he really cares. It's, what we think. I think it's Sep underscore Bladder. At, especially, uh, especially a kid named Giuseppe LaRocca. He'll definitely care with that Italian kid. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different story. He still eh? uses AOL, I think, or maybe even Juno. <laughs> Sep at AOL. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sep Bladder at AOL. Um, let me ask you. You might be on Netscape. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about this before after. before we um before we move on though. Like this is the last question. I'll start. Who, who with do you yeah. like? But um <laughs> no, I, I don't. But but do you think do you think there's any team out of the field that can like gain anything from it's like would it, I'll ask it a different way right the United States national team had a had a pretty surprising run I mean for a lot of people them beating Spain was one of the, probably the biggest U S victories maybe ever right they got to the Confederations Cup final do you think yeah. do you think that that helped that team that, I mean they didn't they didn't necessarily have a very good World Cup the following year but like can it, can any of these teams that are there yeah. now, like you mentioned Mexico, does this is this going to help anyone? Like, is a team going to like get in some confidence? Maybe a player emerges. Like, do you, do you see a team that could get get anything out of this? Yeah. I, mean, I don't mean like winning it. I just mean positive, something positive. I mean Brazil. Yeah. I mean they've had a string of poor internationals under Scolari. I mean he really kind of needs to straighten the team together. If they can uh, develop a bit of consistency with their play. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they win the thing, then definitely. It's a, yeah, it's but a, like, yeah. at least like it'll take some pressure off Big Phil. Yeah, well, they so don't even get that many games. Imagine together a really anyway. poor showing for Brazil in Brazil in this. Yeah, that, that's what that's what I'm taking out of this. Yeah, I mean, if you can get confidence playing in your your home country among your own fans, I mean, think of the pressure of Next that. Summer, like yeah, that, that's yeah. that's huge pressure. You you are bas- you basically have to win that tournament. So if, if you get that on lock, if you feel comfortable playing in your own stadiums, playing among your own fans with that added pressure, I think, I mean, you, you could roll into 2014 on a high. Yeah. I mean, they just came off that win against France a couple of days ago. It was a pretty strong win. So Well, that was their first win. Yeah, but five also, I mean, that's No, I know. But, I mean, let, let's, let's see if it continues. I think that this roster is very unproven. Yeah. I think that people, I mean, Brazilian fans, I mean, we had Frank on a couple of weeks ago. Very skeptical of the roster, so this is big for them. I think really they're the yeah. only team with anything to gain or lose. I would say Mexico's in the mix too. Mexico's think, in the mix too. Yeah. I think frankly, a really bad Confederations Cup that they they might fire the manager. I mean they they've played three games at Azteca and haven't scored a goal and haven't won a game. I mean it's yeah. it's been a pretty poor. I, they're still a very good. I, I don't. I still think they are going to qualify for the World Cup, but. They have a lot of stuff they need to sort out, particularly up top. Um, and you know, maybe maybe a run in the Confederations Cup for maybe Chicharito or whoever. I don't even, actually I don't even know if Chicharito is going, but but maybe something in the Confederations Cup can spark this team and and get them some wins. I, I don't know, but like that that's a team in need of confidence, in my opinion. And then you can get confidence from any game, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if, if just just some wins. Just because the Mexican public, yeah, they might not care if they win or not the Confederations Cup. They want to win the qualifiers, but just some wins might help just get some some more positive energy around that team because it's a lot of negativity right now. I mean, we watched the uh, the Costa Rica World Cup qualifier the other night, and I mean, you can just hear in the the, the stadium and the fans how 
I mean, they're just very disappointed and frustrated with this team right now. I'm sure the players are there yeah. too. So let's move on to the next segment. Oh, hold on. And last thing, guess whose league is best represented at the Confederations Cup? Uh, I'd love to say Italy, but I have no idea. What it is, is Syria? Syria. Look at that, folks. Best league. Syria. For, best league for second tier tournaments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can put it that way too. <laughs> Well, I mean, you think about it. It's the whole Italian yeah, national yeah, yeah. team, yeah, you know, yeah. Brazil. But um, <laughs> well, Patu's on the Brazilian team, probably. Right? No, he's definitely not. If he is, that's a shit. Look up if Patu's on the team. That'd be a freaking crime if he's on that team. No, no, I don't see him on there. No. Oh my okay. god! All right, thank God. All we right. get in the pot, and no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> let's buzz, buzz. Let's cut, cut to our next segment, and uh, it's the segment that everybody's been waiting for. By everybody, I mean. <laughs> Two and three. A couple of us. Whoever's listening. Transfer buzz. buzz, buzz. Where's our where's our producer? Oh, producer didn't show up today. Okay. <laughs> uh let's go. Well, biggest biggest name today, obviously. Uh I don't know if this is rumor or official. Take it for what it is. Fifty million fifty million pound bid for Cavani from Chelsea. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Mourinho made it kind of clear he wants him. Yeah. Cavani, I, I think I feel like Cavani might be just starting to feel like Real Madrid aren't aren't going to be coming and taking him to the, well, to the prom. So I feel like he might just be settling for let's, second best. Do you have a take here? Uh dude, that's a that's a lot of money. I don't know if I don't know if Chelsea are really going to throw all that in. Napoli want want to hold out for what the release clause is, which is even higher. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone's going to even get near what the release clause is for him. They're going to have to sell him for less than that. Mm-hmm. I don't. I see. It, you're you're right that it's a lot of money, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Chelsea are going to clean house with these forwards. Torres is absolutely not going to be there next year. They will they will kill him if they have to do that. They'll, someone will kill him in a mysterious like rowing accident or something. He'll a little, not be a little uh, mysterious <laughs> nuclear poisoning. I <laughs> like Putin. Um, Dem, I don't think Dembaba is going to be there. Um, Lukaku is going to be back, but I don't think that. I mean, he hasn't played a lot for Chelsea in the Prem, so I, I think they're going to bring in people. I mean, Hulk has been rumored. Cavani's been yeah. rumored. Jacko has been rumored. It sounds like Marino's pretty set on on bringing in forwards, um, and some of that's obviously rumor. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I personally, I think Cavani's probably going to end up in England because I, I just don't see Madrid coming in for him, and I don't think he's going to go. This is this is what I think. I think that Real Madrid aren't going to make any of these moves until, until yeah, that's a good point. Ancelotti is is signed. Yeah. Until Ancelotti signs with Real Madrid. Yeah. See what Chelsea, in my opinion, is doing right now is they're bidding high because they know. Cavani is looking at Real Madrid. Yeah, yeah, Cavani yeah. wants to go to Real they Madrid. Want, and they want to wrap so this let's up. wrap it up before yeah. Ancelotti yeah. signs, right? And before they start to make their decisions, yeah. let's wrap them up and let's make him a player. Think, because if he if he makes his mind, if he has to choose well, between if, Chelsea yeah, Madrid, and Real Madrid, Madrid, and the bid, the bids are fairly yeah, the same. Madrid comes in. For it's him going. To, he he's going to, to Madrid. Go. He he yeah. said it. His dad says it. Says it. And if you know a South American's father, father. says it, it's pretty much yeah. 100%. It's gospel truth. This is my take on the transfer season, and I think this is steaming hot. The X factor in almost every top transfer in Europe. Do you want to know who the X factor is? I already know because you, you already tweeted this out. I tweeted it out. So but it's even, so true. This isn't even steaming hot. This is like a reheated take. Nobody's looking at my Twitter. <laughs> Carlo Ancelotti is the X factor. Do you want to know why? Why? All right, I told you about Cavani, right? Yep. We also have Iguain, who's on the move, right? Juventus wants Iguain, Arsenal want Iguain. Where the hell is Iguain going to go, right? But also you have Juventus and Milan, you know, clawing away at Tevez. They're putting Tevez. Somebody's got it. So Juventus is putting Tevez kind of on the back burner, yeah. waiting for Iguain to make his decision. Yeah. But Real Madrid's not going to make their decision on Iguain until Carlo Ancelotti. Not only that, but Jovetic as well. Jovetic as well. Yeah, exactly, Jovetic as well, who you know, is playing second fiddle to Higuain, in my opinion, as well. And the, the, another big name that, that you have. So, I'll save it. And anyway, take a look at that. Kind of it's a web. see where all the it's strings are. It's a web, and Carlo Ancelotti's in the middle of it. Once Carlo Ancelotti moves to Real Madrid, everything's going to just blast wide open. 
But what's what's a good One metaphor for that? Let's explode. just that's no not what I'm saying. It's cinnamon. It's synonym, right? <laughs> explode. But just everything is gonna just wide open. It's gonna be crazy, crazy transfer window when Carlo Ancelotti well, goes I to mean, Real Madrid. You gotta you can't rule out Ronaldo though too, because this Ronaldo move is kind of throwing a little twist into the Real Madrid transfer saga. Because they gotta look, wait, they gotta wait and see. Well, look, let's see. So this was the big name that I was. We're gonna, throwing a lot of names out. I was right gonna now. throw. Look. I was gonna throw out a big name, but this actually just gave me an idea. Are you, are I'm you gonna throw of, the name out. Suarez is who Real Madrid might even want. Maybe. But they're not gonna make a move until Ancelotti's there. Right. But maybe more than Cavani, right? Do you, what do you think? Do you think if real? Let's I say, think realistic. So Ancelotti goes to, to Real Madrid. They they're gonna they're gonna need a forward. I mean, I think we can all agree. Iguain's leaving. I don't think anyone feels like Benzema's Benzema's the guy. So they need a forward. Right, they're gonna spend some money. You'd think. Do, do they go after Suarez? Or do they have the Cavani? Co- Who's priority? Cavani one? one, Suarez two, and if they can get both, they'll try to get both. Who won? I mean, I would. I think I, I think that's fair to say. Suarez, I think, fits well with what Madrid would want to do. Yep. He doesn't want to be in England anymore, right? The, the no, media, I think that's the media clear. hates him, rightly or wrongly. He feels like he's been kind of victimized. I don't really have a whole lot of sympathy for him, but you know, he it, it can be can't be easy for him, right, to <laughs> yeah, to be yeah. dealing with this. I think he likes Liverpool, but I think he feels like he's outgrown the club. Yep. They're really trying to build with, with youth more than anything, and I think he just wants to be out of there. He'd love to go to Spain, I'm sure. He seems like he's a Madrid fan to begin with. Um I think he'd prefer to go there. Liverpool aren't gonna sell for cheap, clearly. Um still cheaper. He'd still be cheaper. He'd be cheaper than Cavani. There's no question about that. Um, the other thing with Real Madrid, you talked about Ronaldo. There was another name of another winger Real Madrid that's been rumored to go to Maria, Manchester. Uh, Angel Di Maria. It's been rumored Manchester City's been sneaking around looking at him. No They've moves. been signing Spanish wingers and yeah. left and right. So, um, I mean, do you guys do you guys think there's any water to that? I mean, Bale. I think there's a lot of going I the think... other way. I mean, if Ronaldo and, and Di Maria leave, I mean, is there any way Gareth Bale doesn't go to Madrid? This is what I, this is what I think. I think Real Madrid is shopping all of their players right now. To they get a good be. good evaluation be. of what they're all worth. They should be. Because when Ancelotti comes in, management can go to him and say, hey, this is what we can get for this player. This is what we can get for this player. And he has a good idea of, of what he has and what, what the cash flow do you is think coming this, in. Do you think Ronaldo's really going to go? I honestly could see him going. I, at first, I didn't think there was a possibility. Where? When, I see, gonna, where, when I see – what, what was the, the article you sent me the other day? The Monaco – Yeah, the, the Monaco offer. I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of money. And oh, Madrid would sell him for that amount of money. Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't you? Why, sell why wouldn't you? You, you could sell him and buy like four good, really good players. You, I you think. Lose uh, one great I player, think he but, he'd be gone in that case. I mean, do but do I don't think do you, I don't think just Ronaldo, just just to give them some context. What so so there was a it's just a it's been just a rumor. Monaco's obviously been kind of a big name, and they've been splashing cash around. There's a rumor coming out that they were ready to prepare 133 million dollar. Uh, bid for Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, again, like uh, there's probably a lot more. There's probably a bucket load. That, that's a high sodium count in that in that story. I'm yeah, sure. For sure. Um, but it it's bears that maybe you know that there's a rumor. I mean, but to me, as much as I think Cristiano Cristiano, I think he wants to stay at Madrid. I think he feels like he still has more that he can do there. Champions League, for example. I think also though. There's very few teams that he would want to go to, you know. At Manchester United might be the only team that he would go to. Um, I don't think he's interested in being at, at PSG. I don't think he's really interested in being in Monaco. I, I think he's a little bit more. I mean, I seems like a guy that enjoys a, a night on the town, but I think he's also pretty driven about being a great footballer and considered maybe the greatest football in the world. I think it it frustrates him probably a little more than he says about the fact that how. Everyone kind of puts Messi up here and, uh, and above him. I don't think he likes that. I think that he feels like he wants to stay and compete head to head in that league with Messi and be better. Um, so to me, I don't. I don't think he's going to leave. I, I think that to me, I really just can't see him going over butt back to Manchester United. I think United. So you, you think you think fight. United are a possibility? I think United's the only possibility. I the just only. Don't, I don't feel like United's going to pony up the amount of money Madrid asked for. I think David Moyes. Look, any team. Would what love if Rooney him. leaves? If Rooney leaves again, I don't think Rooney's going to leave. I was convinced he was listen. going to, but now I look at it again. Like he, he's not. Honestly, he's not. He's been on the player. edge like this many a time. He's not yeah. the same player he was a few yeah. years ago. I think, frankly, he 
Rooney thinks there's a lot bigger market out there for him than there is. I mean, really, the best possibility right now for him that I see is is either PSG or Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal. Yeah. I mean, neither. I don't know if I'd consider either of those a step up. PSG, you at the best is a lateral move. Arsenal is probably a step down. I mean, they're below United in the league. Yeah. Um, I just don't think. I think, frankly, Rooney's going to have to kind of come back with his tail between his legs and like take reduced wages at Man U and, and not be a star guy there. That's what I think might happen. Like, they don't, you know, David Moyes and him have a little bit of a relationship, too. I think it might keep Rooney there. I just don't, I don't see United paying the money Madrid are going to ask for to sell Ronaldo. That's, I mean, that's going to be a, a, a huge yeah. transfer. I think that United would rather fly under the radar. You know, they're rumored for Lewandowski. Um, I'm sure they have other guys lined up. And United's pretty good with their buys. They already have Wilfred Zaha, who's one of the few um, English players at the end of 21. Uh, Euros that didn't really embarrass yeah. themselves, and he's going to be a good player for them, I think. Um, maybe Fabregas actually ends up going to Manchester United, too. I, I just don't see Ronaldo going there. I think he's the, it's really the only legitimate option. Yeah, I mean, I see that as the only legitimate option. I think if Ferguson was still coaching, it would be <laughs> it would be a lot closer. But I feel, you know, I think he probably even feels that, you know, he, he left... He still has something to give to the club. Absolutely. I, I, I uh, totally believe that. His his dream to Madrid, I don't know if it really really came to fruition. Well, since also they only won one league and yeah, and they haven't won a Champions League with him there. I think also too, you know, just I don't think he wants to leave Madrid like that. Maybe if they had won a league in a what Champions you, League this year, he would say like, all right. What do you think you know? the fans, the Madridistas' perspective is of Cristiano Ronaldo? Do you think that? The fans are kind of, you know, backing Ronaldo, or do you think it's kind of like you have to prove something still? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I know, I know, I'm it's a, a tough Madrid question, fan. but like, I don't know too many Real Madrid fans, um, to be honest, so I, I can't really, like, I can't really answer that. I, I feel like, you know, I think Ronaldo, and I don't know whether it's just because of like people maybe perceive him as like a like a playboy or whatever, um, or like sometimes maybe his attitude like frustrates people. I mean. When he gets compared, like Ronaldo's always kind of like the bad boy, and Messi's like this, like the angel, though tax evasion. You know, <laughs> you know, so he's so nice, he doesn't have to pay his taxes, I guess. But, um, you know, so I think maybe there's a perception that I think Ronaldo's kind of underappreciated, yeah, to be I honest. Agree. Like with how he's he's an absolutely amazing player, yeah. and and that I personally believe Messi's the best in the world, but I mean. Cristiano Ronaldo in pretty much any other era would be the best yeah, in the world. For like sure. you know what I mean? For he's sure. he's incredible, and and you know he had like a down year, and he still was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I think that to me, if I was Carlo Ancelotti, the first thing I'd say is like, we need Ronaldo in a good yeah. mood. We're gonna build this team around him, Mesut Ozil. We're gonna bring in forwards that those two can work with. We're you know maybe they try to get like a Gareth Bale. I think they're gonna target a forward first. Um. Let's rebuild the defense. I think Ancelotti could probably do that. And and let's go and compete with Barcelona and try to win a, t- a league and try yeah. to do well in the Champions League. I think Ronaldo's integral to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if Madrid are interested in getting better, and I think most Madrid fans least, would, would so. want that, I don't see why you would sell second-best player in the world unless the only caveat to that to me, if Monaco really gave you that much money, I think I would do it. Yeah. I don't think there's, yeah, you, there's you, you, almost no player. You can you can, can retool. And if that happened with, with be, many players, and if and if that actually happened, that would be the most shocking transfer ever. Yeah. If he if he actually went, went to Monaco, I would. I'd maybe stop like some beautiful I don't know what in I would Monaco do. though. I don't know you what. Know, I it's would... a luxury lifestyle, and it's uh, you know if you like. Casinos and gambling, I could see that being very nice too. I think Ronaldo likes you know? a lot of the things in Monaco, but he can also afford. And to he's go a, to let's many let's times. face it, he's he's a Beau Brummel of uh, of of sorts, yeah. and that's a Beau, Beau Brummel's place. You know, it's a yeah, it's not for greenhorns. No, it's not for greenhorns. Now you want to go to say a uh, I don't know uh, an Everton? I'd say a good, nice greenhorn would do well in Everton, but not in Monaco. Yeah, or Liverpool or. I don't even really know what I really know what I'm talking about at this point. I think we're going to close. Well, let's, Let, let's save that for a different podcast. I know what you want to do. That that deserves a lot okay. of time. All right, all right. Short teaser. Something that's been bothering Noah is why don't you just talk about it? Go ahead. No, we don't. We don't have a lot of time. Just a, a teaser for the next no, podcast. Like, well, a teaser. A teaser. Quick. Next next podcast. Um, 
Or maybe not the next, but coming up soon. Hopefully we're going to talk about, this is like leading to a bigger topic that we've kind of, we've all three of us talked about, just the lack of um, youth development in in certain countries, and it manifests manifests itself in these under these under twenty one under twenty tournaments, and specifically for me, um, England's lack of lack of youth quality is uh, disturbing to me. Basically, how young English players suck nowadays. Well, it's not that they not suck, they're stuck, it's but it's how they don't get they, any they're sort good, of they're good and playing then, time. They're good, and then they get strangled yeah. strangled on the benches of these clubs, or they. Get loaned to, to you know just it's a it's a train wreck to me it's a train wreck and and you know people that want to keep making excuses about like English football it's just like I feel like you're burying your head in the sand because it's, it's it's a problem and when you look at other countries that have had success recently specifically in Europe if you want to talk about Spain and let's and Germany two excellent youth systems that just churn out players yeah. um, and I won't. I don't want to go too far because it's, you know it's, we're almost at the end here. But I mean that's that's something that's a, just a bigger topic in general. And I think it's also one thing that American soccer is starting to really do well. Yeah. Um, so that's so. we're going to save that for a future podcast, probably yeah. maybe next podcast, maybe the podcast after. That. It all depends on really what happens this week uh, in, in the confederation. Yeah. Well, more <laughs> in, the, in terms of the transfer yeah. buzz, but yeah, maybe in the confederation. Cup, who knows well, we're going to do a solid. Two three hours on the Confederations Cup. I think in our Confederations Cup special. Yeah, we didn't even get to the team by team breakdown. <laughs> you know, we didn't get to see who's hot, who's you, not. How you thought Italy was even going to do in the tournament? Yeah, that can what be nice. Like, that can be. They nice. they win, they lose. No, it can be this podcast. They win, they lose. I don't care as long as everybody's healthy and everybody's. That's the real victory. You know, that's all that matters, guys. In the end, it's just about our health. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah. Um, Who yeah, wants to close us, it? Let, Who's let closing it? Who wants let to us, close let it? Let us know what you what you think. About yeah, the actually, yeah, yeah. Cup, about transfer uh, transfer buzz. If you have any um, opinions or questions about some of the some of the statistical stuff we talked about in the yeah. beginning of the show, um, you know, definitely let us know. Tweet at so us. So our uh, Twitter, Twitter handle at, at trequartista underscore. Pod. P spell it. T R E Q U A R T I S T A underscore P O D. Are you sure there's an underscore in there? I hope so. <laughs> Let's take a look real quick. So, because uh, uh, I think you're on. Uh, no, there's no underscore in there. No way, really? I think I've been. Yeah, so I guess it's Trick Ortiz the Pod. Right, so just <laughs> T R E. Q-U-A-R-T-I-S-T-A-P-O-D. No underscore. Get rid of the underscore. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, there's no underscore. <laughs> there's no underscore. Uh, but thanks for joining us this week. Uh, next week will be uh, an even greater episode. I guarantee it. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe some sparks will fly. We'll have a great time. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. <laughs>